All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, welcome to the Volleyball Source YouTube channel. My name is Rob St. Clair, and this is a very exciting video today. This is the first inaugural, hopefully the first annual, EIVA Coaches Roundtable. I'm pleased to be joined by all six coaches from the Eastern Intercollegiate Volleyball Association. Uh, we'll, we'll introduce them in order, but yeah, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, let me know in the YouTube live chat if everything looks and sounds okay. Uh, sorry, we were a little bit late getting going. Oh, uh, this is going to be fun. This is the first of a, a series of NCAA men's preview content coming on the Volleyball Source channel uh, leading up to the 2024 season. And uh, we decided to get all six EIVA coaches in the same place at the same time. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, being accommodating with your schedules and your time and my own dumb technical issues. But I'm excited to get into this. We'll introduce everybody uh, starting at the top left on your screen here uh, from Princeton University in Princeton, New Jersey, entering his 15th season, head coach Sam Schweisky. Sam, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Uh, top right uh, from the University of Charleston in Charleston, West Virginia, entering his third season, head coach Luke Reynolds. Luke, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate you. Uh, middle left of the screen from the New Jersey Institute of Technology in Newark, head coach Danny Gonsalves entering season number 10. Danny, welcome. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, dead center of your screen entering his 30th season at the head coach of Penn State in State College, Pennsylvania, coach Mark Pavlik. Welcome to the show. You're a brave, brave man, Rob. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see how... Uh, see how long I can hang in there where you guys can just take over hosting the show. That's, that's kind of the <laughs> goal. Uh, middle right of your screen from George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, head coach Jay Hossack entering season number nine. Coach, welcome. Thank you for having us, Rob. And last but not least, uh, bottom center of the screen, head coach Brian Bays of Harvard entering season number 16. Hey, Rob. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So, gentlemen, uh, the IVA has been around for a very long time. It has seen a lot of change. It has seen um, and the NCAA men's volleyball landscape look like a lot of different things. And uh, there's a lot that's happened since the league was founded in, what, 1971, if I'm not mistaken? Uh, just past the the 50-year mark, going back to when it accommodated college club teams. And I know once upon a time there were, like, two divisions with a promotion and relegation system and uh, – Three, three divisions, even better. So uh, for, for the people, especially like myself, who, who don't know that much about EIVA history, uh, Coach Pavlik having the, be the, being the longest tenured member of the EIVA coaching committee, uh, give us a quick little history lesson of the league with some, some fun chapters along the way and some things about EIVA history that we might not know. Just for the record, I was not there in the early 70s. So, <laughs> uh, but some of the people that were... We have Bill O'Neill was a big proponent of starting it, and I believe he uh, he was at SUNY New Paltz. He was uh, with somebody along with Coach Tom Hay from Springfield that really started to organize a place for everyone to play collegiately. And they were looking at what was going on in the Midwest and what the MIBA had thrown together, I think, four or five, maybe seven years previously. Um, you know, what was going on to the WIVA out in the West Coast and tried to become a, an organization that anybody could play in, whether it was a varsity team, whether it was a club team. And they they brought it up through the 70s and probably like any other growth of, of, any, of any institution, they added, subtracted, modified, and, um, originally just said, hey, if you had a team, this was a place for you to play. And then a couple of years later, they added uh, that you had to have a coach. And, and then I think from there, they started to split from when the NCAA came on board in 1981 and up splitting the varsity and the, and the clubs a little bit, but still had some interplay through that. And in you know, the mid 80s, changed the name to fall in line with what they saw the rest of the collegiate men's varsity world doing and I went from East, East Coast Volleyball League, the ECBL, to where it current stands today with the EIVA. And then from there, I think as these guys have been around, we continually tried to professionalize and, and, and organize and reorganize and tried to 
be everything that we could be to everybody. And eventually when the NCAA said, hey, we've got an NCAA D3 championship, all of a sudden you started to get more and more um, aligned athletic departments and uh, enabled us to do some things and, and kept us moving forward and added a commissioner. Yvonne Marquez was our first commissioner and uh, you know, pushed us through to, um, I think, where we're one of the more organized and professional leagues out there with what we try to do and how we try to do it. That's, yeah, excellent summary. Uh, guys, feel free, by the way, at any time to just jump in, tell some stories, add whatever comments you've got. But uh, I'll also ask Brian, as the guy who's been here the second longest of, of the coaches, the like, like Pev has said, there's been a lot of change. The EIVA has gone through a lot of different looks, including two names, and certainly a lot of different membership. There's been teams that come in, teams that come out, uh, programs that pop up programs that cease to exist movement of some of the conferences and most recently uh it was this last year was the first season with the the current setup of these six teams in the eiva uh, with the the with the nec picking up men's volleyball and a couple of the previous recent eiva teams heading over to play in that conference and uh, now with the eiva having <coughs> six teams which as far as i understand it is the minimum that you have that you need to keep an ncaa tournament auto bid what uh, starting with Brian and anybody else who wants to chime in, what would you say is the current state of the EIVA on and off the court with the movement and the addition of teams and programs in the NCAA? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind to me is just how, how competitive it is now. Every every match, every every weekend. Um, having only six teams, I think all six programs right now are, are particularly strong. Um Coaches have been here a, a long time, and uh, um, with the exception of Luke, but he's a quick learner. So, um, but uh, have a, a chance to, to to build programs and and get the recruiting uh, process going. So, you know, uh, my colleagues certainly can can chime in. But uh, the, the biggest difference for me, I think, is is that every weekend is is um, two really competitive matches. Anyone else to chime in on that? I, I'll, I'll chime in. Uh, having worked at Penn State and now obviously at George Mason, I've, I've seen it for a number of years. And I think coming from the West Coast originally, I think everybody uh, back in the day probably would, would recognize Penn State as being the big dog in the, in the conference. And it was pretty tough for anybody to keep up and compete. I think in the recent years, probably in the last you know seven to ten years, specifically there's been a little bit of shift and i and i don't think it has anything to do with penn state not recruiting the best players and not you know being able to put a product on the floor that is worthy of competition across the country but i think it really has to do with the various administrations supporting their programs to a, a much better extent being able to have full-time coaches instead of part-time coaches now they can devote their full time uh, programs getting more resources, programs getting a little bit more national exposure. Um, you combine all those things together with the growth of men's volleyball at the collegiate game, and you can understand why Penn State still has been, you know, in recent years, the top dog, but there's a lot of other teams that are nipping at their heels and, you know, putting together pieces to be able to win matches against them and against everybody else they play. So it's uh, it's it's a growing time, and the IBA has taken some large steps, and it's it's exciting time to be a part of it. It's an exciting time to be a NCAA men's volleyball fan. I mean, there it wasn't really very long ago when there only were three conferences that fed into the Division One and Two combined tournament. It used to be just the EIVA, the MIVA, and the MPSF, and then huge growth on the West Coast, huge growth on the East Coast. Added the Conference Carolinas, add the SEAC. Both have auto bids now. Like it wasn't that long ago when the NCAA tournament was four teams, and now this year as it's just been announced pretty recently, it's it's going up to eight, going up to eight from seven, which I think everyone would agree is a great move and maybe could even be room for more teams, like maybe even 12. But uh, still, though, there are only two at-large bids because we got six, six auto bids. The NEC hasn't been around long enough to get one yet. So six auto bids and two at-large bids. I, I assume, and this is going to be kind of a storyline throughout this season coming up, is – with the growth of the tournament, I assume that most conferences' goal is going to be to get a second team in. The winner of the EIVA tournament will get in. 
is is it safe to assume that the that the EIVA would love to see a second team play in the NCAA tournament? I, uh, Jay, I'll, I'll ask you this one. Anyone else can can chime in. Yeah, I think historically it's it's not come from the East Coast. It's come from the West Coast, and I think that's because historically those programs have been traditional powerhouses, and they're good programs. I wouldn't be surprised. It, it may not be this year. It may not be next year. But I wouldn't be surprised if in the near future you do see maybe a second team coming out of the East Coast as net large. It's a long shot right now because it hasn't been done, but at least not that I'm aware of. But I, it's it's one okay. of those things where we got to prove it. You know, you you can't just hope that people are going to recognize you have a good team. You got to go out and you got to earn it. And uh, and right now, uh, historically, one program comes out of the IBA and. I think we all know that going in. We're, we're not, uh, you know, we're not jading this at all. So no, I think we were pretty close, though, right? Like in yeah. 22, I thought it was uh, <clears throat> when it was, I think it was Sam and I on the final and having Penn State almost having that at large bit. I mean, I think we're closer than we've ever been to it now. So I think it's, Jay's right, like in the next year or two, three, as long as we're doing our job across the country, I might start seeing it, especially with the added of more teams in the tournament. Yeah, and, it, and on top of that, it's not like we don't know what the criteria is. That the right. is. So it, it's not simply a, an eye test. And you know, there is there is hard, fast rules that you know, the committee looks at. It, it ultimately, ultimately, and I'm sure all the guys will agree with this, ultimately is you got to win with whoever you yeah. face whenever you play. Them. And yeah. if you can take care of business on the court, and something happens where all right, you you don't get the automatic automatic qualifier for your conference. I mean, you've done all you can, and you, you made the best. You, you put your team in the best situation possible when you're ceding control to someone else to make the decision. I, well, yeah, I, say, go ahead. I was going to. I say it as a two part that. Um, one, you know, with only having six teams, like every time we step on the court against each other every game is more valuable because there's no throwaway games, right? You can't pick it up on the back end somewhere. Every game, you know, that that winning percentage has to be higher because you can't get those games back if you're only playing 10. Um, and then the second one is when you're talking about those bids, it's like when we're going to go play these teams at a conference, it's not just representing your school. It's also like representing your conference and showing that you want to assert dominance, not just for, you know the the Mohave Charleston on your on your chest, but you know also the EIBA brand and the guys that are in this call and their teams. So, you know, I think if you can do that, then that pushes us closer to getting that that second berth. But, you know, I think it's it's you know like I said, you play those games every time are, are worth more, and then every time you go outside of your your conference, it's to it's to prove a point for uh, for everybody uh, in your in your conference. I'm glad you brought that up, Luke, because that's exactly what I wanted to ask about next. Because the, with the EIVA, six teams you play, the regular season is just a double round robin. You play everybody twice. It's only 10 matches. That's not much. I, I, I'm not sure about this, but I would assume that's the lowest number of regular season matches of just about any conference in the country. So like you're talking about with creating and going about an, a, a non-conference schedule, how do you guys attack that? How do you attack scheduling it strategizing around it balancing the you know playing as many great other teams from other conferences as you can with you know keeping your record as high as it can be keeping your inner your coast-to-coast travel as reasonable as it can be and uh with not that many in conference games to play on this slate like how how do you and your athletic departments go about scheduling some some out of conference games I think the creator of the Razzle Dazzle model, um, <laughs> Sam, up in the corner there, should, uh, should answer this. <laughs> Let's hear it, Sam. Uh, yeah, Razzle Dazzle was patented um, back in uh, 2019. No, uh, yeah, I, th- I think it's different for all of us. I, I like the flexibility of, of having a small conference schedule because I think we're all uh, we all see that a little bit differently. How to slice up that that pie, right? So for us, we don't have classes. For almost all of January, so that's a great time for us to travel. So we go to the West Coast and play as many uh, top tier teams out there as we can. Uh, and then I think you know uh, how many teams can come play you on your home court uh, is fantastic. I know you know sometimes we've been fortunate. Last year Jay ran a tournament. We went down to him and played some strong teams. I know Danny's able to bring some teams in, which are kind of in our footprint. So it just kind of depends on who's able to come to your gym. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of the secret sauce, right? And it's hard to know ahead of time. 
there's a lot of games you think, wow, that's going to be a tough opponent. We could win, but it's going to be tough. Wow, that's going to be a point we think we can win, but you may not win. And then all those shake out. And as they start going, you go, man, if we had known we would have won those, lost those, we might have scheduled differently. So <laughs> I think, you know, you can be in this game a long time. And, and every year you look back, you go, yeah, I might have done that differently and try to, you know, recarve a different path. But there's so much human error. Uh, is your team healthy at a certain point? Is the other team healthy? How does how do things go? So, you know, just kind of trying to give a nice diversified opportunities, right? So some strong teams, maybe some teams you have a, a better chance of winning and then kind of see how it goes. Well, we're we're not the only team we're conference with six. The Big West only has six. Right. So they're, they're going through the same thing that we are. The only difference being the quality of opponents or maybe the, the location of opponents for Big West being next to the MPSF. You know, that it's a little bit easier for them to schedule high quality opponents where you look at the closest distance between a large portion of us, not all of us, but a large portion, it's three and a half, four hours away from each other at any given moment, depending on who you're playing. And, and in some cases, much, much further. You also look at the fact that back in the day when the MPSF had, you know, what, 13, 14 teams, you had 24 matches out of the gate that were already taken. So their ability to schedule outside opponents was very limited. So you got teams that, like a Penn State, like an Ohio State, which is a well-known brand name, they were they were easier, if you will, to get scheduled against some of those bigger opponents because, hey, who doesn't want those names in your gym? Now you're seeing teams like Hawaii and you're seeing other teams out there that are now, they're used to having so many people want to come see them and want to play them with limited space. Now all of a sudden they're also scrambling to fill out their schedule with high quality opponents across the table. You know, it's, it's not easy. So I think we're all a little bit seasoned. I think we all kind of understand that this is, this is the the law of the land, but with the growth of men's volleyball, it's starting to happen even more rapidly than it used to now, not necessarily any easier now, but in the near future, it will be easier to start to get schedule more and more division one opponents on the East coast. Cause there's just more programs. So I'm a Sam. I like the flexibility. I'd like maybe a couple or a few more teams in the future to make it a little bit less of a scramble, but yeah, we have a lot of freedom. We could do what we want. What's, what's the story of this razzle dazzle situation? I got to hear the story behind that. Uh, so, uh, all right, I guess I'll take that. So when, uh, when uh, NEC last year, right, when the NEC, you know, a couple teams seceded out of our, our league and we had to come down with a new uh, a new format for how we're going to do this, there was a bunch of different ideas thrown around and people were throwing different ideas. And, of course, you don't want to explain an idea and say, well, you know the one where we play twice and this guy does that? So we just – there were a couple different names and one of the ones that stuck, I named the Razzle Dazzle. Um, and then I've been getting a lot of heat for that ever since. So that's that. <laughs> I I think I think it's perfect. I think it fits. I think it's uh, I like it. I'm going to start using. Well, I will that. I will say I I'd rather take heat for that than I'm still getting heat for abstaining from that one book <laughs> nine years ago. That's still the. I think the NCAA are actually going to try and get that patent for the extended uh, tournament. That's going to be the Razzle Dazzle D1 D2 tournament. So that's right. Ooh. Maybe Sam's going to come into some money here soon. Royalties, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I hope you locked that one down at the right time there. So. <laughs> So uh, that's a good segue into the thing I, w- I wanted to ask about next and that you guys are able to play such an expanded non-conference schedule. Now it's a little bit easier than it used to be to play great MEVA teams, play great MPSF Big West teams, travel mm. to the West Coast, have some of those teams come to you, even like Conference Carolina's getting better and better every year. The SEAC is getting better and better every year. There's some familiarity area with some teams in the NEC, obviously. Is uh, in in the assessment of most of you guys, is it still the case to you where I think it definitely was when I was getting into volleyball, where regionally, especially when there used to just be three conferences, East Coast, West Coast and Midwest, there were kind of definitive styles of volleyball being played in the different parts of the country in the 2010s when I was starting to get into the game. It was classically like West Coast smaller faster ball control uh midwest east coast bigger beefier bang and serves all the time like the stereotypes that a lot of us are familiar with who've been watching it for a while am i right in in noticing that the game's blending together a little bit more now it's not as regionally specific as it used to be and kind of just volleyball is volleyball coast to coast uh danny what do you think about this yeah i think a lot of us have been 
in now for a while and have played at our own. I mean, the University of New Haven where I played was much different than where Sam played at Vassar and so on and so forth from there, right? I think <clears throat> we're able to take a lot of what we had learned, what we have experienced in that time, and I think having known most of the guys that are on this call and across the country, we're all pretty much... We have our own things, our own way we want to add to it, but I think the generalized sense of volleyball is getting pretty pretty close, right? Like, we want good volleyball players. We want to keep the ball in our serve and keep pressure. We want to pass the ball well. Um, we want to attack at high efficiencies. I, I think the incoming more of stats and numbers and things of that nature just tell you what the, the lay of the land needs to be um, in the game for you to be successful. I think, I, I think also just like, you know, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, like everyone has so much access to volleyball. Like when I grew up, I couldn't wait for volleyball magazine to come out. You got <laughs> a couple pictures, you heard about some things, you know, now like you watch a club tournament and kids are doing what they saw Engapeth do. Like they just, there's volleyball is worldwide, you know? And I think on top of that, so many different international players and different styles mixing, like you said, but I just think it's the, the visibility of volleyball at this point people to watch and see oh wow and then mimic it like these young kids are mimicking stuff that they see the international players do uh, and they're figuring out ways to do it so yeah i would agree with you i don't think there's a a regional uh separation the only regional thing that makes me cringe sometimes is, is the refereeing not to not to mm. some people on this call up, up in arms but sometimes you go out west and things are, are a little bit more laid back and yeah no we don't call much and it's just let them play and like ball handling you, know. you mean yeah yeah uh and then you come back here and it's a little tighter and, and it's that that that's probably the only regional thing that i would notice um not so much styles of play i think okay well, well i agree with rob that the, the eib is, is bigger and beefier yeah no. we're talking coaches yeah yeah okay 100 percent. okay good <laughs> well and and let's also not forget personnel is changing you know we're, we're all recruiting kids you know, self-professed back in the dinosaur ages, you know, there, there were not a ton of hotbeds. There were a couple, there were a few, uh, and those were very typical. And obviously California being the main place back in the day, but you're seeing good level volleyball across the country and all those club coaches are doing a better job of training those kids. And in the men's game, I mean, let, let's, let's call a spade a spade here. We, we tend to all share information over the course of time where we're probably all overlapping 90% of things that we do. It may not be 100% for obvious reasons. It might be a small tweak in a scheme here and there and maybe in, a, in some vernacular. But the, the reality is it's pretty open sharing amongst men's coaches in the country. We all pretty much do the same thing. So you're no longer seeing this regionalized pocket of this is what this place does and this is what this place does and this is what this place does. It all kind of cross-pollinates. And so – it's exciting though. I mean, every year you can't do the same thing. You don't have the same personnel. So you got to change it a little bit, but for the most part, you know, it's, it's fun. It's good. It's a good brand of volleyball to watch. And I, I think Jay, it speaks to what we've all wanted is, is the grassroots level growing and making sure that there, there are more opportunities for programs to play other programs across the country um, and witness what they're doing, compete against them you know the highest form of flattery in sports is imitation right so i think that's what we're seeing rob back in the day it didn't happen you if if you went to jo's you know there was a maybe 30 teams there and 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 they would come in with their regional like like you asserted their their regional um, personalities and this is how we believe the sport should be done now boy if you go in with i'm only going to do the, i'm only going to coach the way i was coached uh, you're going to be left behind yeah i think there's with with the number of kids that are playing and i also think along the same lines is you know 30 years ago guys didn't know each other well you, you go to junior nationals and uh, as a player and you'd hear things about oh you should watch this team you should and now kids are playing at the age of 12. They're, they're growing up with each other. And it doesn't matter which coast you're on. I mean, every one of us have guys on the team that 
uh, knew each other from way before they even stepped foot in our gyms. And, and I think that's another great, great movement that our sport is going through right now. That I agree with Jay. One of the best things about the uh, the men's game is I think there's a there's a healthy competition uh, environment about it, but there's also a healthy collegiality that uh, we want to see where we can go with this game. And let's see if we can keep our country at the highest levels. And, and I think that's paying off for us uh, pretty well so far. Oh, yeah. At the end of the day, we're definitely all on the same team here with uh, being men's volleyball fans, people, proponents in the U.S., and there's there's no room to not work together on building that sort of thing. Um, so you talked about, yeah, guys from all over the country playing with more similar styles of being more accessible. That expands, though, outside of just the United States. They're a, a big thing that we've seen the last couple of years in the NCAA and all just all all over volleyball, even men's and women's NCAA, is the influx of international players. There has been so many, inter there's so much international talent coming into the NCAA and contributing in a big way. I, I was going through all the EIVA rosters for this season. I counted 17 different countries represented from basically every continent, which is remarkable. So, and um, I think this is a great question for Luke, being the Australian guy on the call, and he's got the Yashemsky and the Berlin jerseys behind him, the guy with the most international experience for sure. Luke, what in your opinion, what's, what's the role, what's the importance, and what's the value of recruiting and bringing in kids from all over the world to the NCAA? Uh, for me personally, uh, I think recruiting guys like that um, adds another dimension and may increase our the quality in the gym that may not have been here prior um, just because I'm recruiting against uh, the guys that are on this call that are all got great programs and I'm trying to build one at the same time. So um, bringing in foreign guys like that helps, I think, lift the quality of the gym of some of these places that might not have access to a brand. Um, but at the same time, I think it also, you know, like um, Sam was saying, it gives access, people, you know, social media gives access to people that are playing in different places. But if you've got guys in your gym that are also, you know, opening up minds of other players around them and sharing stories and, you know, things like this, I think it just adds another dimension of more volleyball being the global game. Like, you know, you spoke about, um, you know, coast to coast, but when you start to kind of like go internationally, like, you know, different countries around the world play different ways. And, you know, if, you bring guys into your gym that add a little bit of, you know, difference to it, you know, it gives you some edge, but it also, you know, it can pique the interest of, you know, people that are coming to watch a game and, and, and things like this. So, you know, it's obviously increasing, not just in the men, but also the women. Um, I was watching a game the other day and there was a, a New Zealander playing and she was killing it and it was good to see. And, you know, that's a small country. Um, so, you know, it's good for the, the access of these players to be able to come to the States and, you know, that with more programs starting up, it also can kind of kickstart some of these small programs that are, um, that are just coming in. So I think it's great. We also just have more access to see them. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, I usually have a little bit more, <clears throat> um, I have some internationals on my team as it's been in the last few years, but, uh, you know, they don't have to mail a DVD or a VHS tape like they did when I, we were playing, right? Like uh, we can get a link, we can see them play. If we're the kind of program that can go out and see them, we can go see them if we wanted to. I mean, this stuff just wasn't happening um, 15, well, 20 years ago, right? Yeah, that's very, very true. And and, let, and I like how Luke really framed this. Let's let's just be honest here. Uh, the quality of a campus or, a, def, or a, a university, let's say, of a Penn State versus a Charleston, there's obviously bells and whistles that come with a place like Penn State. And so it's easy easier i know pat doesn't like when i say that but easier for an american kid to see hey I, I can go to penn state and this is a great place to go and football and all the great stuff right whereas charleston might have a little bit more of a challenge with that just because of where they're located in the size and scope of the university <laughs> to a foreign kid who just wants a good education and wants to play the sport at the highest level they can whether it's charleston or barton or you know somewhere else that maybe the, the the scale and scope of the school is much smaller, they can now bring in a high quality athlete that 
is just as concerned about the academics as they are the athletics, and they can raise the profile of that program in a quick time, in a quick turnaround. You, you've seen what Luke's done in the last few years at Charleston. That program was not historically strong, uh, and not because they weren't, you know, they didn't have good kids, but they just were lacking some resources. And Luke talked to the AD and talked to the administration, and, and now you see the fruits of that labor. So he's done a nice job turning that around. There's And there's a few schools around the country that have done that. And you look historically, Concordia, Rutgers back in the day, I mean, they were very foreign heavy, and, you know, they had some pretty good programs back then. And, and don't you think that it's, you mentioned how easy it is for us to see them. I think the reverse is true too. No. I think every one of our institutions across the board, and not just EIVA, but you know, you know that the admissions and the people that are charged with, hey, we got to get butts and seats, we got to get people paying tuition. They're launching into the global market, and it's easier for those individuals to find out about us too. So, you know, in this day and age of instant feedback and instant information, um, I think you're just seeing the world's growing smaller and smaller. I was just going to say, I, I agree with Jay that Luke deserves a lot of credit for, for building up Charleston, but I just want to not, not be on the record for saying we are the team that gave Charleston their first conference win. So I feel like <laughs> a little credit there as well. I hear it from Brent Stevens all the time too. I think <laughs> So this is exactly how I wanted to wrap up the show, actually, is I wanted to ask, because you guys, there are, there are six of you left in, in the EIVA, but a lot of you have been around for a long time, and clearly the, the chemistry and the dynamic amongst the conference is so good. Uh, you, you guys are all very cordial, friendly, on the same team with growing the game, but you play each other twice a year at least, and there's there's got to be some pretty fiery matches, some pretty fiery rival, rivalries in there. What what are the standard or maybe the best or the the EIVA rivalries that jump off the page to you guys, uh, Brian at Harvard? Let's let's hear your thoughts. Uh, well, certainly the most obvious one for us is the Harvard Princeton weekend every year, and and um, uh, it, it, that's a weekend no matter sort of what the the records are of the teams going into that match. It doesn't seem to matter. Um, it's almost always um, uh, very very competitive. I think our guys. Uh, get up for for that match is as much or more than than any other. So that's that's one we always look forward to, and and uh, the level of volleyball is always always really good on that weekend. Does Sam like to remind you, Brian, that you are a Princeton grad? I'm sure that might have some juice to it. When it's convenient for him, yeah. Every call, especially right, right. <laughs> Well, yeah, we just had our annual fundraising a, a day, and uh, <laughs> we usually hit Brian up. One of the guys, whoever picks the short straw, gets to call him to ask. Right, for there's one brave soul who calls me and asks for a, asks for a donation. <laughs> but I, I would say to, to that larger point, like um, Brian obviously played in the EIVA. Danny and I played, um, have played in the EIVA, right? Like, so you have four people that played in the EIVA through its different iterations in time. And then, you know, you, you know, Jay had his what nine or 10 years at Mason, but you tack on six, seven years at Penn state. And you're talking about a bunch of guys on the call that have been in the league, other as a player, as a coach upwards of 15, 20 years. And I think it gives us a lot of, yeah, a lot of familiarity and sure. When the, when the whistle blows and the, the balls are in the air, yeah, it's very competitive, but you know, I, my favorite thing is when it's over, there's a handshake and a hug and, and it's something bigger than that. So that's, um, yeah, and, and I'll quickly pivot back. I know we're running out of time. You watch conferences around the country, and most men's coaches know each other, but when you watch the pregame handshake in the EIBA, it's like we have a long-lost brother that we haven't seen in a while, and yeah, we're going to compete, but it's always a healthy respect, and it's always a healthy rivalry with everybody. It's a lot of fun to be a part of. I love that, and I can feel it just talking to you guys, and I can feel it watching every EIBA game. So before our... our technical difficulties kick us out of this lovely video chat here just in time uh, guys i want to thank you so much uh, thanks for coming on thanks for telling the people about your league thanks for getting people's appetites ready to go for ncaa men's season and this is uh far from the last piece of ncaa men's coverage coming on the volleyball source channel so luke danny mark jay brian sam guys thank you very much and best of luck this year thanks, thank you, thank you Rob. see you guys soon thanks for watching appreciate it mate